All right, we are ready to get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marguerite Easterbrook. I'm the president of the West Village Chorale, and I'd like to welcome you to our seventh installment of our 49th annual Summer Sings series. The West Village Chorale is delighted to offer these weekly Summer Sings free of charge, though we are grateful for any donations you can give to help cover our costs. Before we begin, I have a few quick technical notes for this week. This week, the chat function will still be disabled. So if you have a specific question for tech or for our conductor, please utilize the Q&A feature at the bottom of the webinar screen. Additionally, the score will be shared on the screen, but we recommend you open the PDF of the public domain score. The link for that is available on our website at westvillagechorale.org on the Summer Sings page. I also have a quick West Village Chorale announcement about our upcoming season. Uh, the fall of 2020 will be practically all virtual and to kick it off on September 12th, we will host our first event, a virtual choral boot camp. We will have presentations on vocal health in addition to presentations about a virtual choir setup and some tips and tricks of the trade. We hope you'll be able to join us for our virtual choral boot camp. That date again is Saturday, September 12th, and we'll be sure to send out emails once registration opens. All right, now on to tonight's program. We're thrilled to have Patrick Gardner lead us singing the Beethoven Mass in C major. Patrick is the director of the Riverside Choral Society and the director of choral activities at Rutgers University. Maestro, it's good to see you and thank you for being here today. Please take it away, over to you. All right, whoops, there we go. It's good to see everybody or not see everybody as it were today. Um, it's a pleasure to join the West Village Chorale once again. Um, we didn't wanna miss one. I have been conducting summer sings for the West Village Chorale now since 1993. So if I'm doing my math correctly, that means uh, at least 27 years. I may have missed one year while I was traveling, but we're not gonna miss one tonight. Um, so let's get going. Um, it's wonderful uh, to, to work with the West Village Chorale. Uh, their conductor, Dr. Colin Britt, is a former student of mine from the doctoral program at Rutgers University. Um, but as I say, my relationship to West Village Chorale goes back many years. And so I'm glad you could join us today. Uh, so we could have some interesting and engaging times with uh, Ludwig von Beethoven's Mass in C Major. So COVID-19, what do we do for a summer sing? I'm sure uh, a number of people tonight have done a lot more of them, of them than I have. I enjoyed uh, joining Dr. Britt and his presentation of the 4A Requiem. Let's see what we do. I'm sure everybody uh, engages in these differently. Uh, some of you may have a glass of wine at hand and will follow along in the score. Others of you may stand and sing, um, sing loudly and fully. You can entertain or annoy your neighbors depending on your apartment setup. Um, technology doesn't allow us to sing and listen to each other, but I'm sure that this will be a perfect performance tonight. Every note that is sung, wherever you're singing, whether it's in New York or anywhere else in the country, um, I'm sure they'll sing beautifully in tune and follow the conductor perfectly. I know we want to get through the music, but since things are a little different tonight and the Mass and C only lasts about 40 minutes, um, I thought we could take a little more time than usual to look at some things beyond the notes and, and the singing. It'll uh, time this out, should be about 12 to 16 minutes or something, not long, uh, so that we can put the Mass and C in historical and musical perspective. And I want you to be thinking about the piece of music. While it's beautiful and entertaining and a wonderful piece of music, uh, part of the uh, idea of listening to Beethoven's music is to see where he's taking us because with Beethoven, we come to a relatively new way of engaging the listener and making a piece of music grow. Um, so I think we'll have some uh, interesting times here. The mass was commissioned in the spring of 1807 by Prince Nicholas Esterhazy. You may know that Haydn wrote six masses for this exact same event. 
once a year, the prince would have Haydn write a mass to celebrate his wife's birthday, the day uh, in the liturgical calendar that represented his wife's uh, namesake day. Uh, Haydn, of course, wrote those masses, including the Nelson Mass and the Pauken Messa. I'm sure a lot of you have sung the Nelson Mass, and many of you may know the beautiful Pauken Messa. Riverside Choral Society was going to perform the Messa, which Beethoven had on his piano while he was writing the Mass in C. Um, and we hope to be able to do that as soon as we're all allowed to gather and sing again. But this is happening within that context. Surely Beethoven felt the pressure of writing his first mass to follow in the footsteps of Haydn, to be performed for the same audience, for the same occasion, and in the same exact physical location, the Barrickkirche at the Esterhazy estate, as the works of the then rever revered composer Haydn. And as it turned out, the performance was not a success. As fantastic a piece as we know it is now, the prince didn't get it. In fact, he pretty much hated it and insulted Beethoven right after the performance. What was it for him that made it uh, so unacceptable? I think it was because it was such a radical shift in the music of Haydn. This was likely reinforced by a poor performance. The prince had written the Kapellmeister Fuchs, who was preparing the choir, sternly noting that he had heard that only one of the five altos was present at the last rehearsal that, he, that had been reported to him. So altos, remember that. The prince won't like it if you miss, all right? After the performance, the prince remarked to Beethoven, my dear Beethoven, what have you done? And in a letter to friends a couple months later, he said that he found the piece detestable. He really didn't get the piece. Beethoven, meanwhile, loved the piece and worked really hard to get it published and famously had it performed at the premiere of the Fifth Symphony on that wonderful concert that went on too long in the cold where the Choral Fantasia was also premiered. It was a long, long concert, but it included three movements from the Mass in C. Then about a year later, it had a very successful performance and people accepted it, enjoy it. So what was it about Beethoven's style that put off the prince? I think the same things that put him off are the things that we find so successful about the piece now. And I think we should take a look at that and have a little chance to think about it since uh, we've got the time tonight. The elements of Beethoven's mature style that we now recognize as pure genius must have shocked the prince in his court. They were used to Haydn's elegant and graceful melodies. Think of the Pauken Mesa. It goes to G major for the Christe. It has a very logical and elegant layout formally. Um, it doesn't challenge so much as it engages you in, a, in almost a fun way. And remember these masses as the prince celebrated them were incredibly big social occasions. They were fun. In fact, Silverstolp, a, a Swedish diplomat who visited um, and hung out at the Esterhazy Palace as did a lot of people. It was, a, a, it was like the Palace of Versailles for Austria. It was literally built to, to uh, compete with Versailles. Um, Silverstolp mentioned that in the Bergkirche where this was performed, people would get there early dressed in their finery and they would go take their chairs and turn them around so that they would face the balcony where Haydn and the orchestra would be because they came to hear the mass. They came not to hear the mass so much as they came to hear the mass that we know, the mass, the concert piece. They came to hear the music. Um, interestingly, the, the prince himself would enter the church on a horse and clop through the horse, through the through the church and go up to the front um, and sit in the, the prince's chair, the throne, I guess we would call it, uh, for this mass. So he was there to be entertained. There were fireworks that weekend. There were other orchestra and opera performances. Um, there were marionette performances. It was a big, big deal. And Beethoven's piece didn't fit the bill. So let's take a, a minute just to discuss who Beethoven was. Um, and, and get ourselves up to this time period here. Um, here we go. You should all see a picture of the young Beethoven. Um, it's interesting, there aren't that many pictures. There's, in fact, there's only this one of uh, Beethoven as a young man, and it's, uh, it's a quite good one. He was born in Bonn, Germany, right on the French border. In fact, the French took over Bonn right about the time Beethoven left, left for Vienna um, at the 
in the middle of the, all the turmoil with the French Revolution. His grandfather was a respected Kapellmeister, and his father was a court tenor and music teacher. So Beethoven grew up to the trade. He was a, from a musician's family. He didn't have a happy uh, um, childhood. His grandmother was sent away to a convent for uh, extreme alcoholism. And his father followed in her footsteps, Beethoven's father, that is, um, was uh, so well known in the town as the town alcoholic that the prince elector noted that when uh, Johann uh, Beethoven, Ludwig's father, passed away, that surely the excise tax for alcohol would go down. So uh, Beethoven was the breadwinner for the family by age 18, and by that time he was pretty well established in the city uh, as uh, a virtuoso pianist and as, a, as a, a, a budding young and exciting fine composer. In 1787, so when he was 17, uh, the court provided funding to send him to Bonn to travel to Vienna where he would hopefully meet with Mozart. He probably didn't do that, no matter what anyone tells you, there's, there's no um, record of, of that happening. Um, and he returned after two weeks due to his mother's illness and his mother passed away shortly after that. However, five years later, he traveled to Vienna for good. He remains there for the rest of his life and rarely leaves Vienna, spending his time either in the city or on the very outskirts of town, uh, living and composing. He moved a lot, lived in a lot of different apartments. His music is often studied in three major time periods. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to blast through this. The early period, he absorbs the style of Haydn and Mozart in the Viennese. He supposedly studied with Haydn, but he told all his friends that he never learned anything from Haydn. However, he clearly learned from the scores of Haydn and Mozart and others in, in, uh, in that wonderful musical milieu. Then comes the middle or heroic period, and the Mass in C that we're singing tonight comes from that time period. And then comes the late period that includes pieces where the boundaries are completely extended, like the Hammerklavier, uh, the Ninth Symphony, the Misa Solemnis, and the uh, the last uh, uh, string quartets. All right. Um, something's not working here. There we go. There's a picture of him in his middle years. And the second, uh, uh, I'm sorry, there we go. The heroic years, 1803 to 1809, finds him writing the heroica. This is a big change in 1803 from his music that pretty much reflected the style of Haydn. He writes Fidelio. Uh, there's a picture of him in this time period. Um, and moving into what uh, Kindermann, the famous scholar, uh, organizes his style periods as the heroic second style period, the violin concerto, and then da 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 da, the fifth symphony and the sixth symphony and the Mass in C is uh, performed during that time period. All right, that's just to bring us up to a little background on Beethoven. If you're interested, you can look at these, are three of my favorite books, the Maynard Solomon Beethoven, which is psychologically driven and gives a great por portrait of who Beethoven was. Uh, Thayer's Life of Beethoven, which is a big doorstop of a book, um, looks like this. Um, and the Kindermann, uh, which I find uh, to be uh, an incredible resource. All right, I hope that was um, helpful. Um, let's take a look now um, and uh, a little bit about the, the style that we call a heroic style and what you're going to sing in here in about three or four minutes here. The heroic style moves from the elegant and graceful periodic phrase structure, carefully organized and delineated that we hear in Haydn to a more powerful design for the music that one, it, what is often remarked on, or remarked upon about Beethoven's music is the psychological progression in his music. We'll talk about that in a second. And what is it that drives that psychological progression technically? There's a sense of drama that comes from intense rhythmic and dynamic contrast. The harmonic content uh, goes much further afield. The chord progressions that I'll show you some in a second are much more powerful. Um, and what we call cyclic construction, where motives not only permeate the entire piece as they do in this Fifth Symphony of Beethoven's, but also um, he brings back important uh, musical signposts in the piece. Um, and we'll talk about how important that is in this time period, and I'll show you how that works. Um, 
I'll get us started singing in a minute. Um, and then I'll, in between each movement, I'll point out a few things that might relate to this. But let's, let's think about how these things um, work. Again, let me share the screen. Um, and I'd like to play just a few seconds of three different parts of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and then talk to you about how the same idea appears in the Mass in C. So you know what a, an amazing uh, accomplishment this is. So here we go. Screen is shared. Now we need to get to, because we're going to need it tonight, that's for sure. Um, YouTube, which is right here. There we are. Uh, it's not what I wanted. Excuse me. And here we go. Listen to this just to remind yourself. <laughs> Well, I assume you know that one. Pa 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 is the main motive, right? And we're going to go to 1909, just to pick one place, because what we want to be listening for is the incredible uh, content of this piece, where everything is interwoven. Um, you're going to hear here at the third mo movement. Ta 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 ta. We're right back to ta 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 ta. Everything is clearly derived from there. So here we are, 20 minutes into the piece, and even an audience that can't go back and listen on their CD players or on their Spotify recordings um, is going to get that. They're going to understand um, that they've come back now to a place um, uh, to a, to a motivic idea that they've heard before. Now, listen, this is, this kills me every time I hear it. It's such a, an amazing moment. This is the connection to the last movement. There we go. I can't see any of you, like I can on a normal Zoom meeting, but I hope you're with me still. Um, I would have taken that faster. Yum, yum, tum, tum, pum, ping, pum, ping, pa, pa. As we get to that point, there's an amazing sense of things that's happening. First, we it's connected with the timpani part. Da, ba, ba, ba. Did you hear that? that the timpani connected it together, and then it builds with that amazing chord before we get C major after we've spent the last 25 minutes in C minor. This is the sense of taking you somewhere, how he builds that over that whole time to get you back to C major. And he's still connecting the piece, it's interwoven. All of those things are interwoven. Okay, I want you to be listening for how that happened as we get to the point at the end of the Agnus Day where the opening of the Kyrie comes back famously and can be so emotionally powerful. I wish I was in a room with you for real so that we could feel that together. And I hope you understand it and feel it in this performance by Mr. Hickox that we're going to use uh, to sing together. Here we go. Uh, back to there. And I have this. I'd like to thank the staff 
and, and uh, board at West Village Corral. We had a meeting to make sure I wouldn't mess any of this up. So far, we seem to be doing okay. Here, oops, spoke too soon. And now you notice, oops, there, you've got your pitch now. All right. And if I can get it to pause, um, here we go. And I hope you enjoy this beautiful um, music. One of the things we just talked about, the surprising harmonic shifts, one of the things that's often commented upon is that this goes to E major at the Criste. So sopranos, be ready for your E natural. And uh, I think it's the altos that come in on the G sharp, maybe, let's be, or maybe it's the basses, but let's be ready for a, to sing a beautiful E major chord when we get to the middle Criste section. Here we go. Um, replay, start.
There we go. All right. Whoops. There's our first movement. I'd like to check in to make sure everything's going okay. Um, Marguerite and gang, I, I don't see the, do we have the two new messages? All right, if anyone else has, okay, everything's good at uh, 755, great, good. Um, we will move on now to our, um, to our next movement, the Gloria. Uh, a quick word about the Gloria before we move in. Um, the while Prince Esterhazy was shocked by the piece and didn't like it, didn't understand it. Um, for us, looking back on it, that that um, uh, uh, that modulation from C major uh, to E major doesn't strike us as particularly odd these days, right? As there's no piano here in this office, but as you hear the opening. straight C major, he modulates to E major. So from C to E, we've heard that so often in Schubert that that doesn't strike us the way it did him. But that Kyrie, when the sopranos come in on that E and the altos and tenors answer it underneath it, first the soloist and then the choir, that was that's a little crazy. And you'll hear in the Sanctus, it gets much, much more, much further afield than that. For us, though, I think one thing that we can hear if you've sung the Haydn masses is this, while this is um, definitely more advanced and takes more risks and steps out there, to me, it's just a logical conclusion. It's not a wild and crazy step like the Misa Solemnis is. The Misa Solemnis just kicks down the doors. I mean, everything, just from length to uh, volume to tessitura and range, everything about it is much expanded compared to what we have in a Haydn Mass or even in the Mass in C. So when we hear that, that Esterhazy was shocked, it's hard for us to understand that, I think, a little bit. If you listen to the Gloria, for instance, you'll hear all of this, the, uh, um, the standard structural parts of a Mass, that you, if you've sung the Nelson Mass or the Pauken Messe, um, it's set up in pretty much the same way. You'll hear the opening, the Gloria, although it's much more powerful and you can see why it would have shocked and scared uh, Esterhazy. Um, but then it goes to this beautiful uh, three, three, four section in the Miserere um, that is lyrical and beautiful and it, it happens right where it happens in uh, Mozart. Uh, and the, um, the ends of the piece, when it comes back to C major, right where you would expect it, uh, with the toniam tu solus, tu solus, sanctus tu solus. That, that's right where you would expect it. And just like Haydn, who didn't always bring the same tune back, but always brought the key back, Beethoven brings the key right back there. And then just like Haydn, he follows it with two, two quick fugues, although they're more extended than Haydn's are. Let's sing it. I got to put my guitar away first, though. So. I'm not sure I can catch Mr. Hickok's first downbeat since he gets to start it and there's no real lead in there. Um, so use your ears and I'll try and pick him up as we go. Here we go. It says Allegro con Brio. So be ready to sing with Brio and... <laughs>
There we go with the Gloria. Now, a quick moment here. Uh, do we have any questions? I know there's a function there for that. Um, here's the, the chat is not working, um, but I think um, right now people are just following along and singing, it looks like. And um, we will move right on now to the credo. Interestingly, that opening that you just heard, de -do -de -do -ba -da -de -da -de -do -de -da, with especially the melody going along, it's, uh, we're, we're not sure whether to trust this story, but Schindler tells us that Beethoven was out in Heiligenstadt, I think, one of the uh, areas that he lived outside of Vienna in the summer when he was writing. And he heard a group of people singing the C major triad incorrectly. And he put that, built that B natural into it, um, into the uh, opening lick there. Again, the credo is laid out exactly as Haydn's credos would be. There's a big A section. And in the middle, right where you would expect it to be at the et incarnatus est, we get the contrasting section. Um, and then as we come back at the et resurrexit, we move from the et resurrexit to the two fugues at the end. I find these fugues thrilling. I think they're some of the most beautifully written fugues. And unlike the Misa Solemnis, you don't feel like you're gonna die as a singer getting through them. Um, they are, um, uh, they're challenging. They move fast and they've got a lot of notes, but it's not an, this ridiculous tessitura that the Misa Solemnis has. And the, the design of the credo is uh, pretty extraordinary. So let's take a look and sing right through it. And then uh, we'll take a look uh, at the Sanctus Ignatius Day as we move along, all right? Um, and back to share screen, back to YouTube. I must say conductors uh, don't normally conduct to recordings. That's maybe the first time I've ever done that tonight. Um, and it feels extremely weird, especially when I disagree for a little bit here and there with uh, the conductor on the, uh, on the recording. In this case, a very fine musician, Richard Hickox, with lots of good recordings. All right. And fortunately for us, we have this one with the score, which is why we're using this. All right. If you're interested in other recordings, there's a great old recording, if you can get hold of it, of New York's own Musica Eterna from the early 70s, I think, with the fabulous Frederick Waldman conducting. Mm. The John Elliott Gardner recording, as always, is really good, although his take on the fugues is so fast. They're breathtakingly fast. I think you might lose a little bit on those. There's a lot of great performances of this. Um, we, the Riverside Choral Society, was to have performed this in November. Um, it looks like that's not going to happen. Um, but again, when we can all get back together, I look forward to uh, performing it. Maybe we can do this at next year's summer sing as well. Here we go, the Credo. All right, you can sing in Austrian Latin or you can follow along with their Italian Latin. Either, either style of Latin will work. You can use Lithuanian Latin if you want to because just you and your family can hear. Here we go, the Credo. Moving along.
go with the credo all right or credo depending on how oops excuse me let me get rid of this for a second we'll come right back to that um beautiful music isn't it two powerful fugues there at the end um really amazing um again the structure like the cre like the gloria is sort of traditional but uh, uh, much further out there in terms of dynamics. You saw those sforzani that bop and bop and bops. Um, Haydn used sforzani, but he used like one at the high point of a phrase, whereas Beethoven throughout this time period, and even early on, even while he's in Bonn as a young man around age 18 in the uh, Joseph Cantatas, uses those sforzani to make a really powerful point. And interestingly, they're different from the regular fortes that sometimes he uh, has uh, piano and forte uh, immediately after each other, and then a sforzando. So he clearly wanted something very powerful and specific with that. Um, let's take a look at this for a second. Um, let's see if I can get this to come up easily. So you're still on my, uh, I should be able to get it down here. Uh, now let's take a look at this chord progression. I mentioned uh, that there are things that we want to look at that make this, um, piece different. Sorry if I'm making you seasick there. Let's take a look at the Sanctus chord progression because I find this really extraordinary. Um, again, um, one of the reasons I don't have a piano here is that I'm such a lousy piano player. We'll leave that for Dr. Britt, right? And David Rolfe, uh, if David's around, I hope everyone will say hi to him. Every summer I see him at these summer centers. But take a look, starting right here, um, 
you see I've written the chords out there. So th this is the same chord progression here. Now we're in A major, which is a little unusual, but other composers would have done that at the time. Look at where he's going, um, especially when we get down here, but even right here, this B flat minor chord. So it starts with a you just heard a little bit of on the recording there and then let's try that again uh, So you see how he just went there from F sharp major to F sharp major seven, right? Which we certainly don't expect you to go to, to B minor, B flat minor, and end up a half step away from F sharp with F sharp. A minor. And scroll down, we hear this arpeggio on now listen to where this is going now. Isn't that amazing how he goes from A major, A major triad, to suddenly out of nowhere to back to A major for the, uh, the next little fugato that we're going to have. So pretty amazing stuff that he could go there. He doesn't go this crazy, but he does go uh, from A major to B flat major to G minor to A, which I find pretty extraordinary. And if I find it extraordinary, you can imagine it probably drove Prince Esterhazy nuts, right? Let's sing this song to um, By the way, I hope you get a chance to sing it with me so I can drive you all crazy tuning these chords. These chords are, th this movement, the opening of this movement, I find one of the more difficult things to tune in the entire uh, choral repertory. We're gonna sing it perfectly tonight though, right? Um, we should have no problem doing that. Let's go here back to share screen and to YouTube, which should be right here. And we are ready, all right? A major, starting out in the winds. Same chord progression like we play. F sharp major.
great job. No one sang out of tune that I could hear at all. Everyone was perfectly in tune on that opening Sanctus. Again, the structure of the piece, the Benedictus, the way it works is very similar to um, almost all Sancti. Uh, it's the way people wrote Sanctuses at the time, all right? Um, let's, uh, before we do this last movement, um, think carefully um, about what we talked about, um, how the last movement, the Agnus Dei, brings the Kyrie, uh, the opening melody is gonna come back, the last 15 bars, are, are, it's, it's identical music. But the Agnus Dei is incredibly powerful, a, a, an amazing piece of music. Um, and um, it uh, ha has these incredible dynamic contrasts and the way it moves into the 6-8 of the Dona Nobis Pacem is just beautiful. It's frustrating for me to have to conduct a recording because I pace it myself very differently uh, in one or two little spots from what Mr. Hickox does. And I want to hear you sing that. Um, but again, we'll have to do that next summer, I guess. Here we go with the, um, back to YouTube. And buckle up and pay attention. There's a lot of tricky uh, tempo shifts here.
Beautifully sung, everyone. I hope your neighbors and your family enjoyed your singing. Um, it was certainly nice, uh, a nice chance to go through the piece, whether you were singing or sitting back and listening and thinking about this beautiful piece and trying to put yourself into that, um, that milieu of uh, what was going on right then. I hope uh, my remarks at the beginning could put it a little bit into context. Uh, it's not the same as being there together. I, I have to say before we hang up tonight um, that uh, it, uh, it impresses me how New Yorkers gather in such numbers for summer things, right? Um, they started in New York um, and they built and there's, uh, there's quite a few of really uh, re a different wonderful summer sings but the West Village Chorale summer sings have been going on for so long and I so look forward to gathering there with uh, several hundred of you um, we have about 100 people here tonight it looks like we uh, only lost six people um, they're probably uh, either checked in to hear Michelle Obama speak um, everybody get get registered to vote make sure we have the right leadership to get us out of this mess so that we can be singing as soon as possible um, or maybe they're watching a Yankee game. Um, Dr. Britt, do we know if my Yankees are beating your Red Sox? Um, I shouldn't give away your secrets. Um, New England, ha <laughs> ha, Yankees are winning. All right, with that, I can go watch the end of the game and hopefully we will continue to win. I wanna thank Colin Britt, uh, who has uh, been uh, a delight uh, to work with over these years. And this last couple of weeks, he's been my teacher helping me work on my virtual choir chops, uh, like the West Village Chorale. Um, I'm working with all my choirs to keep us engaged um, and working who knows what will happen as we move along. Um, uh, clearly our November concert won't happen. I don't think New York New Yorkers will be allowed to gather in numbers for a, in a concert hall. Um, our plan was to perform the St. Matthew Passion at Carnegie Hall on uh, April, on April the 5th, I think it's the 5th, the day after Easter. Uh, we still have our deposit in and the date reserved. We will see it if we can get back to rehearsing in time uh, and if Carnegie Hall will be open in the spring. Again, think about how we can get the right leadership to get us out of here. I think I'm saying that neutrally enough, um, but we do need people who can think about uh, how to uh, lead us uh, to the next step to keep us all healthy and safe. And with that, um, I want to thank uh, Margaret, Marguerite, um, Catherine, um, and uh, Liam for their help uh, putting this together. Um, and here's to everyone. Be safe. Be well. Enjoy your Beethoven. Have a great week. Thank you. Signing off. Good night. Marguerite. I can't hear you. Oh, there we go. I was muted. Sorry about that. Uh, I was just going to say thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you for leading us in an evening of Beethoven and for leading your 27th sing. Um, yeah. It's always a special treat to have you at our summer sings, whether they're in person or virtual. Yeah. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, awesome. Again, the West Village Chorale is happy to produce these weekly sings for free, but we gratefully accept any donations to help uh, cover the costs. Uh, before we go, I'd just like to tell you about our next and sadly last summer sing. Um, next Monday, August 24th, Michael Conley will be leading us in a sing titled A Song of Peace. We'll be singing various Dona Nobis Pachum and Agnus Dei movements from different masses, along with a couple shorter individual pieces all centered on the theme of peace. Uh, Michael is the former artistic director of the West Village Chorale and currently the director of music ministries at Calvary Presbyterian Church in San Francisco. So he'll be directing us from the West Coast. Uh, we hope you'll be able to join us. Um, and so that's about it from me. Uh, we hope you enjoyed your evening and consider making a donation to the West Village Chorale. Patrick, thanks again for a wonderful sing and for your 27th sing with the West Village Chorale. We really appreciate it. It was um, a real pleasure. Thank you. thank you. And good night, everyone.